You would know that, Deborah, from all your singing. See, as these suffragists sat in the sand and said something silly. I Susie suffragists sat in sand and said something silly. Yeah, that's a good. Susie suffragists sat in the sand and said something silly. Wonderful. Well, great. Come on in, everybody. We're really glad to Welcome to the meeting. There's plenty of room. Plenty, plenty of room. Usually it's just the three of us. So. <laughs> I don't know if we've got any seats that have this many people in them. You know, there's always extras with all the crowds. Oh, Ooh, we could do um, like when they did the Silent Sentinels. Right. That's a lot of people. And like, people don't have to talk. They're silent. There it is. That's a good role for everybody. That's a good All right, people. We're going to get this party started. We have a few more people coming in. Absolutely no rush. Sit wherever you'd like. On. We might take ours off, we'll be well away from you. And Rebecca, do you need a hand? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. So, everyone's got their song sheet, right? It's totally optional to sing along with us tonight, but we hope you give it a try. The governor says that we're allowed to sing. You just have to keep your nose and your mouth covered and sing through your ears. Oh, Deborah, I have one more herstory trivia answer to hand out. Have you been studying up during the pandemic? Who wants it? Anybody? Anybody? Wait, try over there. Maybe someone over there wants it. All right. All right. So, is everyone familiar? <laughs> You'll love it. It's fine. So, is everyone familiar with the tune to the Battle Hymn of the Republic? Yeah. Okay. So, this is the Battle Hymn of the Suffragists. It's the same tune. So, everybody sing. Our hearts have felt the glory of the coming of the time. Agenda. But abolitionist and suffragist Julia Ward Howe didn't just write the Battle Hymn of the Republic, she also co-founded the American Woman Suffrage Association. Mm -hmm. Encyclopedia Tory, there will be a quiz on all this, folks. <laughs> now, as president, I'd like to officially call the meeting of the Suffragist Reenactment Society to order. For those of you joining us for the first time, which looks like most of you, we like to start things off with a little song to get us warmed up. We summon the spirit that way. Oh, I like that one, mm -hmm. then. Having summoned the spirit, we can now hear reports from our treasurer and our historian before getting to work selecting and planning our future suffragist reenactments. Now, does everyone have their eye and nay cards? See, we each uh, do suffragist reenactments because we're just clueless when it comes to women's history. <clears throat> Not all of us. <laughs> Some of us majored in women's history. Yeah, most of us are just dummies about how women got the right to vote. Like, we could have called this the Women's History for Dummy Society, but Deborah said that. I, I think what Lynn is trying to say <laughs> is that we exist to promote history. Or her story. Yeah. Her story. The Suffragist Reenactment Society exists to promote and celebrate the work of our American foremothers in getting the right to vote. Now, every school child can name the author of the Declaration of Independence. But can you name the author of the Declaration of Sentiments, the document that proposed that all women and men are created equal? Can you? It's Elizabeth Cady Stanton! The Declaration of Sentiments called on women to fight for their constitutional right to equality as U.S. citizens. I thought you were saving these for your trivia. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The Suffragist Reenactment Society exists to educate and inspire us all. We bring women's history to life. We each take turns proposing different reenactments, and today is pretty exciting because... Wait, can I tell them? It is big news. Come on. And today is pretty exciting because we're deciding what reenactment we'll do here in Montpelier on the 4th of July. I am highly excited right now. We've been asked to select a reenactment that best speaks to the ideals of America, something that makes us feel proud to be American and that highlights all the unique contributions of the suffragists. Begin 
Oh, yes. Um, Tori would like me to remind you, this is not a Civil War reenactment group. <laughs> While, of course, the women's suffrage movement would encompass the Civil War period, we decided to leave hardtack, musket training, and hoop skirts. to other organizations. Trust me, you do not want to be wearing a hoop skirt on the 4th of July. Okay, Okay. well, do you want to give the historian's report now? It is next on the agenda. Oh, uh, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> this is the historian's <clears throat> report for October 30th, 2021, given by Tori Nichols, <laughs> great, great, great niece of Clarina Howard Nichols, who was okay, the first woman to address Vermont legislators in 1852 about the property rights of married women. I got a picture of her. Check out the sausage curls. Um, thank you, Tori, for enlightening us about your family connections to the movement. Did you have anything else you wanted to make us aware of? Yes. You mean there's something not covered in your reenactment Bible or in all of the trivia you passed out? I know. I feel terrible. I mean, it's such an oversight. I, I could have included it in the preface or the glossary or the chapter on the pancreas. Uh, Tori, the index. Tori, Tori, we do have a packed agenda ahead of us. Right. Well, it is related to the first official herstory trivia question. I wanted to make it all more interactive, right? Okay, um, I am excited. Are you excited? Okay, yeah. this is how it's gonna work. I will ask a question, and then whoever thinks they know the answer, you just shout it out and hold it up in the air for everyone to see. Do they get a prize? Prize? They get it right. Oh, yeah. They get the prize of knowing something about women's history, don't they? Go ahead, Tori. Yeah, okay. So, what were women who fought for the right to vote in America Call. Who thinks they have the answer? The suffragists. Yes! 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 The suffragists. The Americans were the suffragists. The suffragettes were in Britain. The Americans chose the more gender neutral term. See? Isn't that great? Oh, let's try another one. Okay, good. <clears throat> Which women's rights movement was more militant, the American or the British? Oh, definitely the Brits. Under Pankhurst, they chained themselves to buildings, heckled politicians, broke store windows, and even planted explosives to get the right to vote. That's inspiring. <laughs> got it, Tori. Glad we got that straight. Now, Lynn is next on the agenda, everyone. Lynn is our resident costume expert and society treasure. You have the treasurer's report for us, Lynn? We have $182 in our bank account. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Uh, 27 cents. <laughs> what about talking about our dues, what they're used for, and so on? Oh, oh yes. <clears throat> you see this hat? Now, this is a fancy hat. Check out the brim on this baby. The velvet, I mean the ribbon. The suffragettes, <clears throat> the suffragists, they were going all over the country lecturing from state to state. They went out there in their corsets and their shirtwaists, knocking on doors, marching in parades and stuff. It was hard. But if every day, every day they got to put on one of these gorgeous hats, why then, they were all right. Their hat was their one luxury. And for black suffragists, their hat was their crown. Black women would show up at meetings looking like you wouldn't believe so that the white ladies would take them seriously. They wanted to show that the vote mattered just as much to them too. All I'm saying, folks, is that if you want to reenact some suffragist history, you're gonna have to pay your dues so we can make some cool ass hats. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn, for reminding us of why we should all pay our dues. Pay your dues. <laughs> okay, everyone, are we ready to move on to considering what reenactment to do for the 4th of July? If you look at our agenda, you'll see I have some patriotic options on there. And Tori has put together a wonderful binder, as Lynn said, with some script ideas that highlight all the amazing accomplishments of the suffragists. Beginning with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I think we should show them one now. Oh, well, they only just got here. I don't want to confuse anyone with all the history and all the different suffragists. I mean, but how are they going to learn if we don't, you know, show them? I'm ready! What are those? They're like playing cards for suffragists. <laughs> They're very large playing cards. Well, I can't keep these women straight like you two, so I have to make 
some pictures. Plus, it'll help us all follow along, right? I mean, we are talking about 72 years of history here. I like them. Thank you. All right, then. Uh, shall we do our Senate of Falls? Mm -hmm. I think this would be an excellent choice for the 4th of July, since it's all about women declaring their independence. OK. We're going to need you to use your imagination. We are going on a little journey, see? Hmm. To the Seneca Falls Convention, 1848. 10 o'clock in the morning on the 19th and 20th of July, it's already a July event. Seneca Falls launched the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Oh, uh, suffrage, from the Latin suffragium, which can be translated into vote or prayer, but my Latin is a little shaky. Okay, so we're gonna travel back in time to Seneca Falls. Can you picture it? it me neither. I'm a visual person, but things were different in 1848, like all the ladies wore gloves. Ooh, speaking of gloves, Charlotte Woodward, who was the youngest to attend Sen uh, Seneca Falls at just 17, um, well, she's aged a bit here, <laughs> but, but she said... Oh, go ahead, Tori. Reenact Charlotte's words for us. I think I did okay. She's gorgeous. Thank you. I do not believe there was any community anywhere in which the souls of some women were not beating their wings in rebellion. Every fiber of my being rebelled. For all of the hours, I sat and sewed gloves for a miserable pittance, which once it was earned, could never be mine. The men took their money, see? I wanted to work, but I wanted to choose my task, and I wanted to collect my wages. So Charlotte got a bunch of her friends together to go see what these women's rights might be about. Now this part, I can picture. Young Charlotte sitting in a wagon being pulled down a dusty country lane by a fat little pony. They drive 40 miles that morning when they start seeing more wagons and carriages and chaises and surreys all driving to meet at Seneca Falls. <laughs> but when they finally got to the church, it was locked. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, that great noble hero, sent one of her nephews up through a window to unlock the door and let everyone inside. Can you picture it? It must have been a bit like it is here, today. The women and some men all gather together. Yes, there is Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist and champion of the women's suffrage movement sitting in the front row. Well, his role in the movement is a little complicated, but he did say, but he did say, <clears throat> no man, however gifted in thought and speech, can voice the wrongs or present the demands of women with the skill and effect, the power and authority of woman herself. Except the women at Seneca Falls didn't know what to do with their meeting. See, few of them had ever spoken in public before. They didn't even know how to run a meeting, so they had to ask the men for help. But they knew what they wanted. They knew what brought them together that day, what rebellion burned in their belly. Oh, show them your Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Deborah. She does a fantastic Stanton. It's all fiery and proper at once. We are assembled to declare our right to be free as man is free. <laughs> To have such disgraceful laws as give man power to chastise and imprison his wife, mm -hmm. to take the wages which she earns, the property she inherits, and in the case of separation, the children of her love, to have such unjust laws, if possible, forever erased from our statute books. <laughs> Strange as it may seem to many. Oh, this next part's the radical part. Like, really radical. It was not a given that women would even want to make this happen. Hold on to your hats. And, strange as it may seem to many, we now demand our right to vote according to the declaration of the government under which we live. Yes! They demanded the right to vote! Oh, uh, aren't we supposed to take a vote today on whether or not to perform Seneca Falls at the 4th of July? Every bit as patriotic as the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. <laughs> right. Um, all those in favor, your first vote. All those in favor of reenacting Seneca Falls, wave aye. There are many good roles. Anyone opposed, wave nay. Tori, can you count? Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, we have, we have a nay? Okay, it's okay. We won't judge. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I will record the vote right over here. But we're going to look at a few more options. 
options, right? Oh, oh yes, there is so much more to talk about. The women at Seneca Falls couldn't imagine how their ideas would spread, how women across the country would be inspired by the very notion that women and men were equal. Like when abolitionist Susan B. Anthony was fighting to end slavery, she also- Wait, check her out. Deborah always likes me to reenact Susan B. Anthony. Oh, you just capture her energy, I think. Well, years after Seneca Falls, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton became a team fighting for women's rights. Stanton would forge the thunderbolts and Anthony would fire them away. For 50 years, they showed us how women could work together to make bold, radical change. Woo. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, why do we always start with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony? I, I get that they were besties and all, but there were women going way back who wanted their rights. I mean, heck, there were women here before America was America. What were they doing? Well, go ahead, Tori. Okay. Uh, the, the early suffragists looked to the Native American women and saw that it wasn't God ordained that they be subservient to men. They really dug women's power. Like in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, where indigenous women could appoint male leaders, uh, control property, have custodial rights over their children, rights that white women didn't even have then. Oh, oh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy isn't in the notebook either. It's okay. I, so I found a picture though. This is Gahano Caroline Parker Mount Pleasant, a Haudenosaunee woman from the Seneca Ooh. people. Would you look at that regalia? It is gorgeous. But how could I leave that out? Maybe I should make an addendum. <laughs> so much rich history. Let's move on to the heroes. Or she wrote. Wait, wait, let's reenact that. I've been working on my indigenous land acknowledgement. Can't we reenact something with indigenous women? I mean, they were the original Americans. That would be patriotic, right? Yeah, yeah but we don't have a script or anything ready for that. Oh. I tell you what, let's put that idea in our parking lot over here along with some other possible events, shall we? I still think we should call it the idea big. It sounds British. All right, well, I will add the name in the parking lot to the parking lot, Tori. Raise your hand. Name. Yeah, eyes. Nice. And look, Lynn, I've written Indigenous Women. See, oh. see everyone, we just put our ideas on this whiteboard for later. Oh, we do have a couple of votes for that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Center. Okay, everyone, if you look at our agenda, you'll see I have some more patriotic stories for us to consider. I was thinking we can tell the story of the women's rights conventions in New York, or we could reenact the abolition movement, where women work to bring about the ending of slavery. I thought we agreed not to do the Civil War. Well, we don't have to talk about, uh, we don't have to reenact the Civil War to talk about slavery and women's rights. The abolition movement and the women's rights movement were intertwined. We could reenact Maria W. Stewart in the 1830s. Well, she was a free black domestic worker who was the first woman to speak to an audience of both women and men. I bet you she could have run that meeting in Seneca Falls. How long must the fair daughters of Africa be compelled to bury their minds beneath a load of iron pots and kettles? I asked the iron pot myself. <laughs> she was condemned for daring to speak in public. Ooh, or we could try Lucretia Mott or Lucy Stone from the 1850s. Or stay with me now. We could stick with characters we already know. I could do my Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lynn could do her Susan B. Anthony, or Aunt Susan. Oh, we could show everyone how they worked to sway the legislators to grant women full suffrage in Kansas. Oh, what do you think, everyone? You want to try to reenact the battle for Kansas? Yeah. It's a newer script for us. Auntie Clarina Howard Nichols did travel from Vermont to Kansas in 1854 to promote suffragists. Fantastic! Oh, Lynn, show them your pictures. Uh, Tori, you can be George Francis Trey oh. and set the scene with your next trivia question. Oh, the battle for Kansas is great because you can really see the sacrifice these women made for us all. Elizabeth Cady Stanton left her seven children behind to go on the road. She endured fleas and bed bugs for the cause. Oh, oh her street trivia question. I feel like we should have a bell or something after these. Oh, uh, ding! Oh, yes. What happened in 1865, just before our suffragists went to work in Kansas? The end of the Civil War? Yeah, yes. the end of the Civil yeah. War. Good job. The country was still reeling when Kansas put these two amendments to the test. One, giving women the right to vote, to vote and the other, giving black men the right to vote. If both amendments passed, Kansas would become the first state in the country with universal suffrage. Votes for everyone! Let me hear you say it, folks! Votes for everyone! Okay, but let me set the scene. Okay. okay. <laughs> At first, 
things looked good for the two amendments. But as the campaigns went on, each side began to see the other side as a threat. You could either let black men vote or women, not both. Lucy Stone and the other suffragists had to call for reinforcements. Enter Stanton and Anthony. It doesn't look good for us, Susan. We're out of money. And the legislators are fighting to give black men the vote and not women. If Kansas women can vote in school districts, they should be allowed to vote in every election. Mm. The abolitionists support our cause, too. Then where are they? I don't see your friend Senator Wood here, Susan. We are not going to win this thing with the Republicans' help alone. Don't you see? The Equal Rights Association can't fight for both black people and women at the same time. We have to choose. Well, any man that votes against female suffrage is a blockhead. It's true. What do you think we should do? I want you to meet my friend, George Francis Train. <laughs> He's a flashy dresser. And rich. <laughs> George has agreed to travel the state with us to rile up the voters for our cause. Oh, people just love him. You should see him do this bit about the poor wife at the wash tub and the drunken husband who comes reeling in. The crowd just <laughs> roars. <laughs> All right. Truth and justice is bound to win. If women can rule monarchies, they should vote in republics. <laughs> you know, I invented the uh, coal chute for the coal cart. You did? And the eraser for the pencil. Uh, and now, Susan B. Anthony, we are going to invent a paper for the suffragists. Its motto, men, their rights and nothing more. Women, their rights and nothing less. <laughs> and ladies, ooh, I am going to publish your paper. Ooh. We'll start off in uh, Leavenworth, mm -hmm. then on to Lawrence, mm -hmm. Junction City, Topeka, then back to Leavenworth come election day in November. We're going to get them all fired up for the right amendment. Woman first and Negro last is my program. <laughs> He's sus. Why not? Well, uh, if you're playing Anthony, then you say, give the vote first to woman, and then Stanton says, just think of Patrick and Sambo, who cannot even read the Declaration of Independence, making laws for their female better. better. Sambo, isn't that like, you know, pretty racist? Oh, well, Anthony thought that once women had the right to vote, they could help black people. This was an early fight in the suffrage movement, and we see Stanton and Anthony's strategic thinking. Yeah, but I don't get it. Why just work for white women? Why not work for votes for both? Why make friends with people like Train? The suffragists were losing the fight for the vote. Oh, let's go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of reenacting the battle for Kansas? Ayes? Anyone? Good? Nays? You know, even Sojourner Truth spoke up when the 15th Amendment passed in 1870, giving black men the right to vote and oh. not women. Oh, yes. Uh, Truth said, I believe, uh, apologies. <laughs> I feel that I have the right to have just as much as any man. There is a great stir about colored men getting their rights and not a word about the colored women. And if the colored men get their rights and the colored women not theirs, then the colored men will be masters over the women and it will be just as bad as it was before. How about we sing another song? Maybe you know this one too? Oh dear, what can the matter be? <laughs> oh dear, what can the matter be, dear? bogged down in all the politics in the movement. There are plenty of patriotic suffragists we can shine a light on. Um, Lynn, who do you propose we look at next? <laughs> who do I propose? Yes, Tori and I put forth a battle for Kansas for everyone to consider. You rejected it, now it's your turn. Um, since see, next on the uh, agenda is further reenactment proposals. Pick something patriotic. Maybe we could reenact pantaloons and bicycles. Yeah, you know, reenact Amelia Bloomer. And you want everyone to reenact pantaloons and bicycles? Uh, they kind of go together for suffrage, you know. Um, uh, uh, who votes I? Please. Uh, <laughs> Stanton did say, 
Woman is riding to suffrage on a bicycle. Uh, ring, ring. Um, why don't we put that idea in our parking lot along with some other possible events, shall we? See bicycles and bloomers and question mark. Does anyone have any other ideas? Or we could reenact Victoria Woodhull. Victoria Woodhull? Mm -hmm. She was a traveling clairvoyant. That could be cool, right? <laughs> Victoria Woodhull, uh, AKA Mrs. Satan. Um, she was the first woman to address Congress, and Woodhull and her sister were the first female stockbrokers on Wall Street. She even ran for president 40 years before we had the right to vote. And she was a proponent of free love. Uh, free love? Mm. On the 4th of July? Yep. Yeah. Is that really patriotic? Well, why not? I mean, Woodhull said uh, women should have the right to escape bad marriages and control their own bodies. <clears throat> why doesn't Lynn have a go at her 1871 Steinway Hall speech? Uh, and the truth shall make you free. Maybe. Check out what she gets to wear. Is that a taco? Yeah. She was wildly popular. Uh, but this speech is long. Oh, and look, the fourth row there is getting antsy. <laughs> yeah, but this is what we're here for, right? To learn about the great women in American history. Plus, it would be totally patriotic to hear from the first woman who ran for president. Yeah. Uh, you know, she, she, she was a big crowd pleaser back in the day. Maybe if we all got involved. Uh, all right, well, what, what do you want us to do? Oh, you can be Utica Brooker. One of Woodhull's sisters, who was a laudanum addict, and uh, shot a bit hiss at Woodhull from the balcony in the middle of her speech. <laughs> tough crowd, tough family. Oh, All right. Well, then, I think what we'll do is. Are you going to rally my supporters over here? I am, yeah. I'm just getting ready. I'm sorry. I'm going to rally all of you. We're going to All right. All On this side, we're all pro Woodhull. These are things that you can yell if you like, or you don't have to. You can just yell things like, we like her. <laughs> or, I like her a lot. Or, Rusty Jones has boom. I come before you to declare that my sex are entitled to the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Reply, free love. Ah, and are you a free lover? I am, and I can honestly, in the fullness of my soul, raise up my voice to my Maker and thank Him that I am. Woo! Yes, women should be. I stand before this vilifying, introducing community, representative of healing for the bruised hearts and crushed affections of humanity. Prostitutes. Whoa. Yes, I am a free lover. I have a right to love whom I may, to love as long or as short a period as I can, to change that love every day if I please. And with that right, neither you nor any law you frame have a right to interfere. Nominate to be her vice president. Frederick Douglass. Yes. <laughs> Frederick Douglass? Yeah. Douglass never acknowledged the nomination, feeling betrayed by white women who wouldn't support black suffrage. And Woodhull didn't get a single vote when she ran for president. Aww. She spent election day in jail. Now, who wants to reenact Victoria Woodhull for the 4th of July? I! Woodhull, Woodhull is in this land. But I think we need to concentrate our efforts on teaching everyone about the really important names in the movement. <laughs> Victoria Woodhull was. Help me, Tori. Oh, her argument laid the groundwork for the LGBTQ rights movement and a century later. I mean, she's really very fascinating. Yeah, but she's a public relations nightmare. Remember? <laughs> Mrs. Satan? She set the whole movement back with her reputation. If we go down this road, it just becomes compliment. Com com complicated. There's the sex scandal, eugenics. Huh? Um, there's lots to talk about. I think we need to choose someone a little less complicated to represent us on the 4th of July. Like Susan B. Anthony. Well, you can't just ignore her. Yeah, but we don't. She's on the dollar. No, the dollar coin. And no one uses those except me. I think we have to. <laughs> We have to acknowledge how influential Susan B. Anthony is, Lynn. Look, if we can get best-selling books and Broadway musicals 
about Alexander Hamilton? Then we can spend a mere five minutes reenacting the life of Susan B. Anthony, can't we? Everyone, Because Alexander Hamilton, the man, was a bit of a jerk. Yes. Even if he did invent our financial system. But Lin-Manuel Miranda, the actor and writer, though, is amazing. Do you think he has a rap about Susan B. Anthony? Susan B. Anthony dedicated her life to getting women the right to vote. She never married. She never had children. If you want to talk about scandalous women, let's talk about Susan B. Anthony's arrest. <laughs> really? You want to reenact the scene of a crime for uh, Trust me, this is not Fourth of July material. Her name is Susan Brown Anthony, and there's a million votes she hasn't won. But just do it! Just do it! All oh, right, everyone. You are about to witness a crime. Come, come. First, she cases the joint. Get into character, Lynn, go on. Shop boy, I am here to register to vote. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I don't think we can register your name. <laughs> <laughs> Under what grounds? The Constitution of the state of New York only gives the right to franchise <laughs> to male <laughs> citizens. Franchise means the right to vote. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> Are you familiar to, with the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? I am. Then tell me, boy, am I a citizen? Why? Yes. Then as a citizen, I have a right to vote. Now, young man, how are you going to get around that? It looks like you're going to have to register me. And he did. But Susan B. Anthony's life of crime was only just beginning. Show Lynn. Ulysses S. Grant. <gasps> she can't vote. She's a woman. Ah, arrest her. Ta-da. <laughs> means? What that little piece of paper means? No. Maybe. Uh-huh. Once upon a time, it was a crime for women to vote. A crime to express your views, to have a voice at all in how our country was run. Anthony committed the crime of voting to wake people up. Back then, no one was paying attention to suffrage, so Anthony put herself on the line. Back then, no proper lady would get arrested or go to jail. But Susan B. Anthony did. She stood up to injustice for us all. How many of you would be brave enough to do the same? Yeah, how many of you have been arrested? Lynn? Yeah, don't be shy. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You've been a little civilly disobedient. Uh, or a lot. High and proud. All those in favor of reenacting Susan B. Anthony's crime, or as I would argue, Susan B. Anthony doing her patriotic duty. But didn't she get some type of presidential pardon last year or something? <laughs> Ridiculous. She didn't need a presidential pardon. She needs a cape. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were women's rights superheroes. Super sheroes. I know. I know. Um, I think that people want to learn about someone new on the 4th of July. I mean, right? Like someone we don't always talk about. Raise your like hand. Who?
party! Drag her from the tree! Yes, she is exciting all in uh, favor! I veto reenacting fighting for insurance purposes. <laughs> Wells then sued the railroad and won a five hundred dollar settlement. Now we are talking. There is some justice in the world. Well, a higher court later reversed the ruling. I take it back. Uh, but I don't think the trial is even the coolest thing Wells did. She founded a newspaper and investigated the lynchings of black men who wanted to vote. She she told a story that America needed to hear. Now that's patriotic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she so enraged the locals with her reporting that they burned her newspaper to the ground. But she did not run away. Listen to this. <laughs> I bought a pistol. <laughs> I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. Standing up to someone with a gun in your hand, now that is sadly very American. Ida B. Wells is amazing. But we're talking about the 4th of July. No one is going to want to think about lynchings and all that awfulness. There are other suffragists we can look at. They all stood up, they all sacrificed, but according to this, they weren't all standing up for the same thing. I will cut off this right arm of mine before I ever fight for or demand the vote for the Negro. That is your shady Auntie Susan there, Deborah. We can't reenact that and feel good about America, can we? I tell you what, let's just skip all the heavy stuff. Oh, let's go to the parades. That'll be perfect. We can have some fun. And who's ready for another song? A patriotic one? How about we do a suffragist version of Yankee Doodle? Okay, here we go. When Uncle Sam set up his house, he welcomed every brother. But in the haste of his new life, he quite forgot his mother. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, our brothers must not plow us. Mind the music, keep them step, they will not vote without us. <laughs> I mean, the vibe is immaculate. Yeah. Oh, performing the suffragist Yankee Doodle at the 4th of July celebration. Oh, the parades would be so great to reenact. Oh, we could do the 1912 parade up Fifth Avenue, led by Mabel Ping Wali on a horse. She was just 16 years old and already fighting for Chinese workers' rights and suffrage. Oh, but I think the 1913 parade would be exciting to reenact. Oh, let's send around a sign-up sheet. We need a lady on a horse. Does anyone have a horse? No? No? Come on, Mobile. Does anyone know anyone that has a horse? Yeah, could you ask her to bring it next time? It would be so extra. I don't think you get a horse up the stairs. Yeah. Oh, first three trivia question. Ding. Ding. Oh. Uh, who was president in 1913? Uh, yeah. Yes! Woodrow Wilson! There were little pockets of it. Woodrow Wilson! Now you guys are doing great. You really are, yeah. History question, Tori. I mean, we all learn about the presidents. They're on every, they're in every book, and, and, and when we're kids, we get that tiny little placemat with their faces on it. Well, I wanted to ask them about Inez Milholland, but I didn't think you know who she was. Do you know who she is with? Oh. Inez Milholland, she was a lawyer and she dressed up as Joan of Arc. Got wear a crown. Kind of superhero like super hero. Mm. Yeah. Uh, she led uh, 5,000 suffragists up Pennsylvania Avenue with 20 floats, uh, nine bands, four mounted brigades. Everyone showed up before Wilson's inauguration to show some attention for the cause. All parade floats would be wonderful to reenact. Hey, they marched during inauguration just like we did during the 2017 Women's March. When you were knitting those pussycat hats, any pussycat hat knitters in here, right? You were doing the same thing as our suffragist sisters back in 1913, just with different hats. I told you, the hats were major. Oh, oh history trivia time. Ding. <laughs> Who organized the first political march on Washington in 1913, like the first major march? Paul. Who said? Yes, Alice Paul. Nicely done. Remember the militant Brits? We have a picture of it. Remember the militant Brits, right? Well, Alice Paul hung out with them in England and learned all their strategies. And when she got back to the U.S. and saw that no one was paying any attention to women's votes, she decided to shake things up a little and get some attention for the cause. She organized an incredible group of suffragists, including Helen Keller. Oh, if we're reenacting uh, the 1913 march, we are going to need a mob of men. 
So some of you uh, can, can harass us when we march, right? So some of you can like curse the women and spit at them, throw them at the guards, and you can like punch and grab and pull and try and You are. <laughs> oh. It's it's her story. No, it's okay. I like big hats and fur muffs, and you like fisticuffs. <laughs> what was so brilliant about Alice Paul is that she got sympathy for women's suffrage when it was practically dead in the water. Um, but it looks like it was just white women she was fighting for. Bit of a theme here. What's this about not wanting to offend Southern white women, Tori? Was that like a thing? Lynn, you got to the Ida B. Wells part, right? My citation there is a Teen Vogue article. <laughs> Alice Paul said, as far as I can see, we must have a white procession or a Negro procession or no procession at all. Yeah, but then Wells told Paul, either I go with you or not at all. I am not taking this stand because I personally wish for recognition I am doing it for the future benefit of my entire race. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But Ida Wells did march. She marched with the Illinois delegation, supported by her white co-suffragists. Well, some of them. She could have been killed by the mob for integrating the march like that. <laughs> what would Alice Paul have done then? I mean, shouldn't everyone get to march in parades? It Alice like Paul Alice suffered for the movement. Listen, she was the first person, the very first, to put protesters in front of the White House. Nobody did that then, certainly not women. But Paul organized over a thousand silent sentinels. They stood there in the cold and the rain. Oh, we could show people that. They need to see Alice Paul taking on the President of the United States during World War I. She spoke out when the easiest thing to do would have been to keep her mouth shut, like a good little patriot. But she, she challenged the United States to be better, to fight for democracy, not just abroad, but here at home. Yeah, but Alice Paul was really just fighting for white women, though, wasn't she? Listen to me, there was no Alice Paul, there was suffrage. When the police turned their back when women were being beat, they beat Alice Paul. When they jailed these women for seven months, they jailed Alice Paul. But she kept organizing. She led hunger strikes from behind bars. They were force-fed for suffrage. Does anyone know what it's like to be force-fed? Maybe this is the story we need to reenact. When the forcible feeding was ordered, I was taken from my bed carried to another room, forced into a chair, bound with sheets and sat upon, bodily constrained by a murderess. Then the prison doctor, assisted by two women attendants, placed a rubber tube up my nostril and pumped liquid food through it into the stomach, twice a day for a month. From November 1st to December 1st, this was done. Hurrah for woman's suffrage, hurrah, hurrah. For woman's suffrage we shall fight because our cause is just and right, hurrah. Hurrah, hurrah for woman suffrage. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah for woman suffrage. You realize that it's sung to the tune of Dixie and that they used to perform it in blackface? Give me that. What? No, you don't deserve it. What are you talking about? You don't deserve to hold our history when all you do is put it down. I get it. All right, I get it. The suffragists were racist. They were probably homophobic and anti-Semitic, just like everyone else at the time. But why, in? I don't understand why you even bother coming here if you insist on pointing out everything the suffragists did wrong. Why are you dragging my heroes through the they mud? They are my heroes, too, and I am not dragging them through the mud. I am just saying they have got some mud on them. Come on, Deborah. You keep pointing out what all these white ladies did right, but it's like you're afraid to talk about their racism. Why? Because I want people to care yeah, about them. You... If it weren't for these women, neither you, nor I, nor Tory, nor any woman in this room would have the right to vote. You can't just ignore the white supremacy of the movement. Fine, our heroes were not good people. Are you listening to me?
to mean is not about whether they were good or bad people. It's about... I don't know what you expect us to do. It can't all be about the white ladies, Deborah. Look at your board, at our proposals. Now look at the room. See our pictures. Look at all of the women of color that did this work. We need to talk about all of the suffragists and not just the greatest hits or whatever. We are white. We can't reenact women of color. We can't perform in blackface or pretend to be indigenous. I'm saying we need to talk about the racism and we won't perform in blackface, but, but we can be creative. We need to talk about suffragists like Ida B. Wells. We are a reenactment society. Well, can I read you an Ida B. Wells quote? <sighs> Go ahead, Tori. <clears throat> the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Now how can we? How do we shine a light of truth on them and still honor them? I mean, how are any of us here supposed to right any of these wrongs? Is it, is it even possible? I think so. I mean, we don't like to stop studying history because we learn horrible things. At least we're not supposed to. Uh, remember that place map we give the little kids with all the president's faces on it? Yeah. And there are streets and towns and schools named after some pretty shady dudes. Uh, Thomas Jefferson gets a whole university and solos in Broadway musicals, and he 100% owned slaves. And then there's George Washington and his team. How are we supposed to do this then? The minute you start shining that light, you see a lot of bad stuff. What are we supposed to do about it? I mean, look at you, Lynn. How long have you been working on your indigenous land acknowledgement? Six months. Yeah. It, it's just that we are on stolen land all of the time, and we need to acknowledge the atrocities and the eugenics movement and the residential schools and everything America has tried to do to destroy Native Americans. But indigenous people are still fighting today. They are leading us in the fight against environmental racism. They are water protectors and organizers, and I have so much more to learn. How are we supposed to get this It's paralyzing, like but, I don't want to get out of bed but, some days. But it's so exciting. I mean, just think of the Abnaki we could interview. We have to get this right. We have to learn everything, and there is no oh, rules. Wait, wait. The suffragists were a mess. Uh, we are a hot mess. What if our goal isn't to get things right or perfect? I think trying to be perfect is part of the problem. And then we study in history class, sure as heck weren't perfect. Yeah, but we still study them, don't we? They were flawed, but they did some radically good stuff. It's like your Ida B. Wells quote, Tori. We need to shine the light of truth here and see it all. And then we need to be better than they were at being intersectional and thoughtful and and some days, we get our fam together and dress up like the suffragists and put on a show. All right, fam. <laughs> All those in favor of shining a light of truth on our suffragists and working to get it better today. Eyes? Uh, all right. <laughs> Nays? The motion passes. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I think that's probably enough history for today. Um, we can table the discussion for the 4th of July until our next meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Wait, wait what? No! We can't leave it like this, all, all torn apart. If we're going to get things better, then we can't act like the National Woman Suffrage Association versus the American Woman Suffrage Association. Am I right? You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, Tori, I kind of want to take this corset off. But we can't leave it like this. We haven't gotten to the victory. They don't know how it ends, right? I mean, oh, the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress on um, June 4th, 1919, and it was ratified on August 18th, 1920. But you don't know how it happened. Don't you want to see how, like, what went down? You can vote aye. We don't have to do all 36 states. We can just skip to the last one, Tennessee. It is on the agenda, Deborah, and you can reenact the hero of the hour. 
Carrie Chapman Cat. No, I do love Carrie Chapman Cat. She's a Carrie Cat stan. Shout out to all my queer suffragists. Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. Everybody can get involved. You want to see it, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Ah, yes. It was Cat who came up with the winning strategy to gain suffrage state by state. Oh, I'll be Sue, uh, Sue White, one of our silent sentinels, mm -hmm. and now lead organizer in Tennessee. Oh, and you, my dear, can be Josephine Pearson. Josephine Pearson? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be the bad guy. You said we had to talk about the racism. No, yeah, but I don't want to be a racist Tennessee anti with my underwear all in a bunch about women staying in their separate sphere. Fun fact, I didn't actually wear yeah. underwear. Oh, it's getting hot in here. And it's going to get even hotter because it's August of 1920, and we are going to Tennessee. Tennessee. It was the War of the Roses. Red roses for the anti-suffragists or the antis. Some folks over here, if you look under your chairs, you might find a red rose. If you do, feel free to wave it up in the air. All it means is you chose the wrong side. <laughs> All history. And yellow roses for our suffragists. Yes, you might find a yellow rose over here under your chair. Feel free to wave those up in the air as well. All right, then show everyone the mouth. Fine. I get to wear the fancy hat. Okay. I'm gonna need someone to play my dead mother. <laughs> like this trio right here. Yeah, all right. You're um, just gonna say blech, and then you're dead, okay? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Hotel has a rose in his lapel, letting us know which side he's on. Red roses give a shake. Oh, oh, there are too many antis here, and they've got big business on their side too, like the alcohol industry and the railroads. Oh, the railroads don't want women to vote because that might They're mean higher wages for women and child wine. labor laws. Can't yeah. have that. No, you oh. just drink some wine. And what's happening here on the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth floor of the hotel? What are all those men doing in that private room? Oh! Thank you for supporting our cause. <laughs> Why, they're full of bribing them with, with liquor. But, but it's prohibition in the state of Tennessee. Oh, the drink is powerful stuff. They're fighting dirty. Get out there. We need to check in with every single one of our supporters and make sure none of them get gold feed. What's that? Oh, my, oh no. I'm hearing rumors that some are being kidnapped. No. Some are getting fake messages to go home because their mom, wife, or kitty cat has taken ill. Oh, there's only one thing we can do. Only one. Mm. We can pray. Hey, sugar, you right here. Come on. We're going to need you to walk here. Thank you so much for offering. All right. Okay. You just put on this coat and okay. wait for your cue. Thank you, darling. August 18th, 9.30 in the morning. An early motion that morning to table the suffrage vote fails, <clears throat> and the ratification process begins. Okay, so we start with two I votes in favor of ratification, so let's cut it down the middle, and you all, ready? And I, 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 and we have four nay votes. Everyone, nay, 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 nay. The seventh man called is this man, Harry Byrne. 24 years old, the youngest member of the house from Mouse Creek, Tennessee, a farm town not exactly known for supporting the cause. He is wearing a red rose, and I expect him to vote against the amendments. I. <laughs> Don't keep them in doubt. 
Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat find your mother. <laughs> Byrne faced a dilemma. Vote against the amendment and stay true to his anti-constituents. He has an upcoming election. Or remain faithful to the wishes of his mother. <laughs> say aye again so we can all hear you pass the amendment. Aye. Hurrah! Oh, You're a traitor to manhood's honor! Why he's been proud to change his vote! What? No! Oh, my goodness. Byrne voted with the suffragists because he thought it was the moral thing to do. And he told the whole world why. I want to state that I changed my vote in favor of ratification. First, because I believe in full suffrage is a right. Second, I believe we had a moral and legal right to ratify. Third, I knew that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. I desired that my party, both in state and nation, might say that it was a Republican from the East Mountains of Tennessee who made national woman suffrage possible at this date not for personal glory, but for the glory of his party. Giving the ballot to the mothers. A Republican from Tennessee, huh? All that work, all the pain and suffering to get a single sentence added to the US Constitution. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Mm -hmm. Let's hear about for our volunteer. Yay! 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 Everyone know the tune to Auld Lang Syne. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago, who pondered deep all human law. The Oh, come on, focus, Tori. Oh, in 1852, my auntie, 
Serena Howard Nichols addresses the Vermont Senate about uh, property rights of married women, and from 1861 to 1865, suffragists put efforts on hold because of the Civil War. No hoop skirts here, though I do have a lovely bonnet. But in 1868, the Fourteenth Amendment is ratified, defining citizens and voters exclusively as male. Boom! Boom. <sighs> the suffrage organizations fight over whether or not to support the 15th Amendment, which would give black men the vote while ignoring women. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton found a second suffrage organization and began a push for a constitutional amendment. The 15th Amendment passes in 1870, giving black men the right to vote. Oh, but Frederick, Frederick Douglass breaks with Stanton and Anthony over their position in support of white women. In 1871, Victoria Woodhull, remember the top hat folks? Yeah. She addresses the House Judiciary Committee arguing for women's rights to vote under the 14th Amendment. Susan B. Anthony votes for Ulysses S. Grant in 1872 and is arrested and put on trial. Oh, I'm jumping over so much. Yeah, we're not trying to be perfect anymore. Just better. Uh, uh, in 1890, Wyoming is admitted to the Union with a state constitution allowing women the vote. And what are our black suffragist sisters doing? Uh, in 1896, Mary Church Terrell, I.B. Wells Barnett, and Frances E.W. Harper founded the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. In 1912, oh, Mabel Pingwa Lee leads 10,000 suffragists up Fifth Avenue in New York City, Oregon, Kansas, and Arizona adopt women's suffrage. 1913, Alice Paul organizes the political march on Washington, uh, and uh, in 1914, Montana and Nevada adopt suffrage, and in 1917, a big year, the Senate Sentinels pick at the White House, asking, holding banners, asking, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? How long must women wait for liberty? Alice Paul is put in solitary confinement in the mental ward of the prison in an attempt to break her. Uh, 1918, oh, the Senate finally passes the 19th Amendment and the ratification process begins. By March of 1919, 35 states had approved the amendment. We need just one more state to pass it. Who is it gonna be? Vermont, maybe. <clears throat> On April 21st, 400 women marched to Montpelier. 400 women marched in the pouring down rain through muddy roads, through snow, 400 Vermont women marched to the State House to demand that Governor Percival Clement call a special legislative session so Vermont could ratify the 19th Amendment. Vermont, give me the victory state! But Percival refused. Vermont cannot afford the expense of a special session. Tennessee gets all the glory of being the last state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Percival. Percival. Oh, Percy! <laughs> Let's do it again! Let's tell all the stories only faster! Faster! Yeah! Like, oh, oh, okay, I'm gonna need your help. I did warn you there was gonna be a quiz on all this. We'll hold up the cards and you tell us what matters. Yeah? Good. I believe in you. You can do this. All right. We begin in America with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, where who had and still has political power? Women. No, yes! Tell me who Maria W. Stewart was. First person to speak in public. Very yes. good! Who wrote the Declaration of Sentiments? Yes! yes. Good work! Who oh, yes. oh. oh, that's right! And who's this Vermonter? Yes! But yes. do you remember Victoria Woodhull? Yes! Yeah. How about why Susan Anthony was arrested? She voted? Oh, yes, exactly! Speaking of civil disobedience, who's this? She's my favorite. Oh. And who remembers what Mabel Pinglaw Lee did? Oh! She rode a horse, 16 years old, advocated for Chinese workers' rights. Yeah. Oh. Speaking of parades, who is this? Oh. Yes! And who is Deborah showing us? Oh. Yes! And don't forget this lady! It was her idea to win state by state. Yes! And what year was the amendment finally ratified? Yes! That's amazing! This is great! And with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, black suffragist Mary Church Terrell wrote, We women have now a weapon of defense which we have never possessed before. It would be a shame and a reproach to us if we did not use it. Wait, wait, so, sorry folks, but if I'm going to do better, then we have to say that passing the 19th Amendment didn't actually give all women the right to vote. Mm. Black women and other women of color couldn't vote for years after 1920. Native American women weren't even <coughs> considered citizens. They didn't get their right to vote until 1965. Wow. On November 
October 2nd of 1920, over 8 million women did vote in elections for the very first time. But it took over 60 years for all the states to finally ratify. Mississippi only signed off in 1984. Sheesh, Debbie. Downer over here. Uh, you were the one who told me that we had to tell all I know, I know. Um, this history is messy and ugly and beautiful. But we have to celebrate our wins and keep fighting. And we have so much to fight for today. And this year, in 43 states, lawmakers have proposed at least 250 laws making voting harder. States across the country are making it harder for black, indigenous people, people with disabilities, the elderly, and students to vote. All those in favor of adjourning this meeting, but continuing our fight for votes for women? Votes for everyone! Eyes? Anyone? Nays? This meeting of the Suffragist Reenactment Society is adjourned. <laughs> Vermont and Vermont Department of Libraries. Give them a hand, everybody.